Please be seated. Uh, before we have a time of prayer, I'd just like to bring you up to date. I'm not sure if you got the email. I'm not sure what Paul sent out. But uh, last week, the house right next door to Paul, uh, Malcolmus, uh, one of your missionaries, uh, about 11.30 at night, somebody shot seven times into that house. Then they came back again about 2 o'clock or 2.30 and shot another five times. Uh, nobody was hurt. Uh, the lady next door is one of the workers in Boston Project, Carol. She's a retired security guard. And uh, we don't know why somebody would do that, whether it was a random thing or not, we don't know. but. Uh, do be in prayer for the neighborhood. A lot of things happen there that I, that you're just never aware of because they can't spend the time writing about all the tragedies that come into the neighborhood. So I know they would appreciate your prayers. Also, uh, their daughter, Gracie, uh, was on a treadmill working out the other day. And unfortunately, one of Lily's toys, the little one, got caught on the treadmill, and she ended up with second-degree burns on her arms, her legs, and her fingertips. Uh, so she looks like a snowman all bandaged up. And uh, in time, it will heal, but probably for a couple of years, she's going to have a lot of red splotches on her arms and legs. So if you could, uh, I'm sure Paul didn't put that out, but... I'm putting it out for my granddaughter. Uh, she's in what, ninth grade now or 10th? 10th grade. And so uh, that, what a way to begin school next week uh, that way. So, uh, and I do bring you greetings from the Boston Project. They had a very good summer. And uh, if you've got on their mailing list, they just sent out a thing. And uh, you can read all about that. This morning's first scripture reading from the Gospel of Matthew, from the 14th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Be reading verses 22 through 33. If you're using a red church Bible, that starts on page 948. Again, the 14th chapter of Matthew, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. O oh, ye of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. May the Lord add his blessing. This morning's second scripture reading from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms, from the 40th Psalm, be reading verses 10 
through 17. And again, in a red church Bible, that will start on page 549. Again, the 40th Psalm, verses 10 through 17. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. There are more, they are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. May he add his blessing to the reading of his word. We want to think about the Matthew passage. And Matthew chapter 14 is an interesting chapter. It contains three different stories or events. Uh, one of them is the beheading of John the Baptist, which Jesus took really hard. The second one is the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, I often wondered what happened to all the leftovers. <laughs> what did Jesus do with the 12 baskets that were left over? Where did he get the 12 baskets? Who comes to a rally for Jesus bringing a basket? <laughs> You'll have to work on that yourself. <laughs> and then lastly, there's the story of Jesus walking on the water. And I've preached from that text a few times in 40 years. And uh, a while back, uh, something caught my eye and my heart. And it's that story where Jesus made the disciples. It says, Jesus made them get in the boat, and he wanted them to row to the other side of the lake. And of course they began after that feeding of the 5,000. Man, they were all filled. They had the food that they needed, the protein, everything to go, and they rowed. And from the time they got in the boat till the break of dawn, they still hadn't made it across the lake. It was a very windy night. And the wind was against them, and they were rolling into the wind. And uh, I can kind of see the boat launching forward a couple of feet, then moving back 10 feet with the waves to the wind. And it was one of those ugly nights. And then somewhere along dawn, they see Jesus walking on the water, and they think it was a ghost. Well, he talks to them, and they realize that's Jesus. And then Peter does something that uh, is in context with his nature. He says, Jesus, call me to come out and walk on the water with you. So Jesus gives him a command, come, and Peter begins to walk on water. Uh, that's a miracle right there. We could spend a lot of time thinking about that and talking about that. But the thing that caught my eye is that after he walked for a while in the water, we don't know for how long, but long enough, he began to sink. He began to sink. And I thought about those three words in relationship to my life. As I journeyed over the sea of life, oh, I got to do this. This guy told me to put this thing on. I don't think I did. And I think it came off. And he's going to yell at me, yes he is. <laughs> this is where I need my wife.
Yeah, and you want to come up here? Come on. Uh, ah, this is good. This is where your wife counts. You can be a... Uh, just put this crazy thing on. All right. All right. All right. You got sound up there now, fellas? All right. And so we have uh, Jesus calling Peter to come out on the water. And, uh, and he does. And like I said, he walks a while. Thank you, Karen. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, he begins to sink. Goes down. And I thought about my life. I said, what areas of my life are sinking as I journey on the sea of life? As I confront the storms of life, what areas of my life are sinking? As I confront the unknowns of life and the things that just come out of the blue, like COVID, am I sinking or walking? And so I said to myself, well, gee, I began to think about from March till now, how many people are sinking in the area of finances? You know, you might have had your six months put away for an emergency, but we've passed the six months. Now you might be really starting to sink. How many people are sinking in the area of employment? They've lost their job. They don't know if they've got one to go back to. Maybe they've only been working part-time. Some people are sinking there. And then how about other people who are now becoming more addictive to drugs, to alcohol, to gambling, because they've been housebound and because they cannot handle the situation because God is not in their life. And so they're hoping that a pill or a drink or a winning hand would bring them peace. How about people now who are struggling with relationships? They claim that that's been one of the hardest things for couples to be at home together for that long a time. Relationships aren't what they used to be. Some of them are fractured. Some of them are very broken. And how about people's relationship with God during this time? There's probably some angry Christians out there as well as the rest of the world. Then let's think about our morality. A lot of people during this crisis are kind of bending the truth a little bit. They might be stealing. They might be a little bit less honest. How about we as God's people? How are we doing with our Christian disciplines? Are we still reading our Bible? Are we still praying? We still go in the church as much as we can go, whether that means by the computer or in person. What are we like? And so I thought to myself, well, I'd like to put together a sermon on this whole area of are we sinking or not? And so I designed a way that I wanted to do it, and let me give you the outline so you can follow me. Okay, first thing we're going to think about is sinking in those familiar areas. Sinking in a familiar area. Secondly, we want to think about sinking while doing God's will. Hmm, that's interesting. Thirdly, sinking because we've lost focus. Fourthly, sinking undetected. 
Fifth, help for the sinking. And lastly, hallelujah, sinking is not the end. Let's go back to the first point. Sinking in a familiar environment. Where was Peter when he was sinking? He was on the Sea of Galilee. He grew up on that sea. When he was three or four years old, he was running on the beach, picking up whatever, throwing it. As he got a little bit older, he learned how to swim in the Sea of Galilee. As he got a little bit older, he learned how to row a boat. As he got a little bit older, he learned how to fish. He knew everything there was to know about the Sea of Galilee. Yet at that moment of time, a place that was so familiar to him, so much a part of his life, he found that he was sinking in that very sea. And I'd like to suggest to you that you and I have areas of life that we're so familiar with that we can find ourselves sinking in. And I can't preach on all of them, but let me just give you a few to think about. One is our church. I will say something about that. One is your place of employment. One is your social hangout, wherever that might be. Some of you might be quilters or knitters or sewers, and you hang out with those people. You know, you do it together once a week. Or some of you might have another hobby, and socially you hang out with people. As they say, birds of a feather flock together. <clears throat> and so it might be that area. It might be family life. Oh, yeah, we're familiar with family life. So let me start there. Family life can certainly be an area that we're familiar with and certainly be an area where we find ourselves that we're beginning to sink. Karen and I, we got married way back in 1968. I can hardly believe it's been that long. Uh, and as we got married as a young couple, we had dreams of growing together. We had dreams of having a family together. We had dreams of doing God's will and honoring God in our life. We had dreams that we didn't even share with each other at that time, but we were kind of hoping they would come true. And uh, we've had a great run, 52 years plus and still going. And uh, I'd like to just share one instance. I could share a few more, but one will suffice it. Very early in our marriage, I was not very patient with my wife. Now, I know the rest of the men here that are married, you've never had that trouble. But, uh, but when we went someplace on a trip or went to an unknown state or just traveled to an area where we never had been before, Karen would always be my map lady. Remember those maps you could get at the gas station? Pull into the golf gas station and you get a paper map for free. No charge, it was free. Put out by the golf company or whatever gas you use, you, they had maps. So she was my map lady. But the only problem was she had a hard time reading the map. And I wasn't very kind. I wasn't very considerate. And I'd be driving along and yelling at my wife, what's the matter with you? Can't you see? Can't you read? Turn that map around. Get it orientated so you know where we're going. Am I going right or left up here? And man, that poor lady, she'd be crying and, and just uh, in tears. And it was one of those familiar environments where things can sink really fast. And I've learned now, I'm the map man. She's the driver, right, Karen? We switch positions. 
But I learned early in my marriage life that I could not treat my wife that way. You just couldn't yell at her for not knowing. Some people can't read a map. Some people can't understand the map. Even though they got two eyes. Even though they might have a, a high IQ. Maps are just foreign to them and they're just and so that was one area that God gave me the grace to conquer. And my wife put up with me for those, I don't know how long it was. You can talk to her after the service. She'll give you her version. Uh, but that was certainly one area where I was sinking in our marriage, where I did not treat my wife with respect or honor and was demanding, angry, not showing love and all the above. So I think we can sit and say that the home life, the marriage, can be an area where we can sink real quickly. And uh, there's a lot you can do to prevent that, but uh, we can't get into that. Let me just talk about church for a moment. Because I think church is another area where I'm always amazed Somebody had come up to me and say, Pastor, I never thought that that person would do that. Or I never thought that person would be involved in that. And what are they saying to me as a pastor? Well, that person who was a part of the church really kept it hidden what they were doing and how they were sinking. And I think that's really true. God's people have a tendency to hide the fact that they might be sinking in some area. Very few times will you have somebody come to prayer meeting and say, hey, folks, I'm having a problem with jealousy. Will you pray for me? Or folks, I've been tempted to steal something. Would you pray for me? We just don't do that. We glaze it over with a nice handshake, a beautiful smile, and we pretend that everything is all right. But we need to remember what the Word of God says, that in the church there's going to be people who quench the spirit. There are going to be people who are lukewarm. There are going to be people who are carnal. There are going to be people who have lost their saltiness. There are going to be people who don't have zeal for the Lord. And so as we come together as the body of Christ, one of the things that we really need to learn to do is to involve others in our life. Because you can sink so fast. And, uh, and we'll have more to say about that as we move along. So sinking in a familiar area, it happens. You're not immune to it, even though you've been in that area a long time. Sinking while doing God's will. What was Peter doing? He was doing God's will. God said, come. Come walk on the water. And I believe that a lot of times Christians don't understand that. Because when we see somebody struggling spiritually, the first thought that goes through your mind is this, they're out of God's will. They can't be doing God's will because they're struggling. Well, that's not true. That's not true. And a lot of times we need to readjust our thinking as we see our brothers and sisters. Some of them are struggling doing the will of God. Now, I remember when I candidated for my second church after I left here. Um, actually, I candidated for another one, and uh, uh, Russ Alts came to see me. He was the radio pastor of WPEL in Montrose, Pennsylvania. 
he came to see me because he was a part of that church. And he said, Jim, he said, uh, uh, the, the church doesn't want you to serve as pastor. They refused my, my resume and didn't want to call me. And I said, that's fine, Ross. So that's all right with me. But he says, hey, I've got another church I sent your resume to. I didn't ask them, but I sent it down. And they're going to contact you. I said, oh, that's great. Okay, Ross. So a few days later, I got a call from another church. We went and preached. And then during the week, I met with them and decided that we would uh, go there. So my very first Sunday there preaching, it went well, I thought. And I mean, after 10 years of being here, how could it not go well? We had 13 people leave the church. Now, I need to tell you, it was a troubled church before I went. I knew that. Because the previous pastor had caused some problems. And so people left, and then I went, and I preached, and some more that were on the verge of going decided to go. And so after we come home, I remember saying to Karen, wow, this is really going to be tough. I was thinking. You, know, you come into a church and now you only got a congregation of 20. You know, you take 13 people away. You know, it's a lot of families. And that wasn't counting kids, that was just counting adults. And so I was thinking. And I said to Karen, well, we're going to stay here. We're going to, because we felt that that's where God wanted us. And so let me just make the story real short as I can. Uh, God did a miraculous thing there, many miraculous things. Number one, he built the church back up. Number two, within what, five years, six years, we put an addition, we rebuilt the church. Physically, new building and new sanctuary and whole business. We had over 30 kids in a youth group for years. When we left the church, we had over 60 people Sunday night coming out to worship. But it all began, and it could have all ended. I could have threw up my hand and said to the church, no, I'm not going to come. But I believe that God would help me. And I said, God, help me. And uh, many marvelous things happened there. And we were there for 18 years. Let me just also share another story with you real quickly. Donna Lee and her husband, Paul, are involved in a singing group up in the Lakes region of New Hampshire called One Voice. And they put on concerts twice a year. And we've got to know them because we've gone to many of their concerts. They had to go to Florida here recently because her mother was dying. So two of them got on a plane, went to Florida. And uh, in the process, her mother did pass away. But Paul had to come back here uh, to Massachusetts because he was having knee surgery. And you, any of you have had knee surgery? No, if you, nobody know me. Yeah, you know all the tests you've got to get before you. Well, he had to come back for all that stuff. And so he flew back and then flew back down to have the funeral and flew back home. And in the process, he got the virus. He came down with the virus. You think that was fair? Doing what he's supposed to be doing, honoring his mother-in-law, respecting her life. And in the process, he comes home, and now he's got the virus. I wrestle with things like that. I don't know if you do, but I do. And, uh, and, and it not only affected him and his wife, it quarantined his church. His church had to shut down. So it just wasn't the two of them. You know, there were further ramifications. But they were simply doing God's will. And they came down with, he came down with the virus. He is healed from it. He is doing good as far as we know right now. 
his wife is fine. But it's just another example where doing God's will, you can find yourself sinking in the sea of life. Moving on real quickly here. Sinking while uh, not just doing uh, God's will, but uh, sinking while doing God's will. I want to talk on that here for a moment. Um, and as we think about that for a second here, um, you know, that's a real struggle, I think, for many of us. So when you find yourself in that situation and you know that you're there because of God, stay true to God. Third thing I want to talk about is our focus. Our focus. Peter was doing great. He stepped out of the boat. Who was he looking at? Jesus. But the scripture tells us once his eye caught sight of the wind and the waves, he began to sink. And I think there's an important lesson there. When God calls you to do something, you need to keep your focus on him and not allow yourself to become distracted because when you do, then fear and doubt enter your life. And that will cause you to sink. Always does. Think of the 12 spies who went out to check out the land. How many of you remember that story? Okay, they went out. They came back. Man, they had these huge pomegranates, huge grapes. Some other fruit that they brought back from figs, I think it was. And they brought back, and the people were all excited about the possibilities of going to that new land. After all, God said it was a land that flowed with milk and honey. But ten of the spies said, yes, look at the fruit, but... And when they said that but, that meant that their eyes had moved from God to something else. But the cities are fortified. We can't break the walls down. The people, they're stronger than we are. We'll never win the battle. And there's more of them than us. And besides that, there's giants living in the land. And so they began to spread that false report. And as a result of the people buying into it, a whole generation of people, don't miss this point, missed out on God's blessing. A whole generation missed the blessing that God wanted to give to his people. How many of us today, sitting here today, have missed a blessing from God because of fear and doubt? And we forfeited something that God wanted to give us. He wanted to bless us. But you chose to be distracted rather than keeping your eyes on God. May God help us to keep focused on him so we don't miss that blessing. Fourth thing, sinking undetected. I really like this thought. Think about it. Here's Peter walking on water. Who knew that Peter was sinking? Only one other person, Jesus. And let me tell you why. The men who were sitting in the boat were not watching Peter. And you say, oh, that's strange. Why do you say that? Because they were too concerned with their own lives. If they were to take their eyes off the waves and allow the boat to be turned in a certain way, that whole boat would have been capsized. When there are 
big waves out there, you can only run your boat one way to keep it from being capsized. And they didn't have time to keep their eyes on Peter and see whether or not he was sinking or walking. They were concerned for themselves. And let's remember it's at dawn. Have you ever been out at dawn? You can't see a whole lot. I've hunted a lot of years. And at dawn, you put a doe and a buck standing together and you're 200 yards away, you can't tell what is what other than there's two deer there. That's it. Very difficult to see somebody. And you've been rowing all night. How heavy do you think your eyes are? Some of you can't stay up past 10 o'clock now. And those eyes just go right down. Well, these guys, they've been rowing all night. And so, friends, there were no way that they were watching Peter. After all, no one screamed out, Hey, he's sinking! No. What does that mean for Christians in the church? Wow. The implications are astounding. Because a lot of times we don't notice that somebody is sinking because we're too busy with our own boat. We're too busy keeping it afloat that we don't take the time that we should take with other people. And some of us don't want a serious relationship with other people. And some of us want to keep the stuff that's going on in our life to ourselves, and we could care less about what's going on in John's life. And so in the church, we have people who are sinking, and you don't even know it. And as I thought about that, I thought about the fact that God needs us to give us discernment with regard to people so that we can truly be a friend. God needs to give us that prayer for that person so we can pray for them, put that person on our heart so we can pray for them. And so as we're in a church, there are people sinking every Sunday. They haven't gone down and under, but they're sinking in areas in their lives. They need us. And we need them. Help for the sinking. I love that. Help for the sinking. When you sink, what happens to you? Let's just put it this way. When you do something wrong, how do you feel when somebody else finds out about it? What? Bad. Yeah, if you're like me, you're embarrassed. Man, you want to hide your head. You, it's not a pleasant experience. And so, you know, here's Peter. He's sinking. It's a bad thing. He sunk in front of 11 guys. Went from walking to sinking. It wasn't very good. Wasn't very good at all. But what I like is Psalm 34 says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them and saves them from their trouble. When we are sinking, we can cry out. And it doesn't have to be a loud sound. It can be a whisper to God. God will hear you and he'll reach out as you say, save me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Lift me up, Lord. Because as you say those words, you are humbling yourself before God. 
And God loves a person who does that. Whenever we humble ourselves before God, God will always honor that. And he'll reach out. I love the fact that my God is always near to me. I believe what it says in 41.13 of Isaiah. Who's got my hand? God. So wherever I am in life as a Christian, I can cry out and God is right there. He's right there holding my hand, ready for when I give him permission to lift me up. He's also willing to do it. You know, sometimes it's a process and not an instantaneous thing. For Peter, it was instantaneous. He was lifted up and they walked back to the boat. Sometimes it's a process that God brings us through. But it's also a reminder that God has the ability to do it. So whatever you're sinking in today, my God says, is there anything too great for me? Nothing. He can lift you up. He has the power. He has the ability to do what is needed to be done in your life. And I like it too because sinking is not the end. It's not the end. Yes, you're embarrassed and yes, you get red in the face and yes, you got to answer for it. But let me just remind you, think of Peter. Was it the end when he sank? No. How about when he denied Christ three times? Was it the end? No. What happened on Pentecost Sunday? Peter, the man who sank in the sea, the man who denied Jesus three times, stood up and preached, and 3,000 people got saved. It's not the end when you sink. God is in the restoration business. When you sink, he wants to restore you. What happened to Jonah? After he swam around in the belly of that big fish, God restored him. And Nineveh was spared. Jonah wasn't happy, but that's not the point. What happened to Samson? As he was brought out on that day of celebration and he stood out there, put his two hands against the pillars that held up the temple. God blessed him with strength. Friends, just because we sink one time, two times, a dozen times, God is not through with you. He is not through with you till you die. Till you die. You have value to God. You have worth to God. God wants to use you. And remind yourself, Peter wrote two books in the New Testament as well. So as we're sitting here today, it's not the end of my life that I sink, but rather it's going to be a new beginning because God's going to take that as a building block and lift me up and begin to build my life anew. He's going to restore me. After all, what does it say in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1? Restore those who have sinned. Ah, the church has a part in our restoration. And we don't have time to speak on that. But certainly as we're here this morning, you can find yourself sinking in four or five different areas at once. Man, then it's a real struggle. But it's possible to win the battle. Because God is for us and not against us. Because he's your Savior and my Savior. 
Let us pray. Father, help us when we begin to sink, to not throw up our hands in despair and to check out of life. Even during this COVID time, we've noticed that suicides have been on the rise. Help those who are thinking of taking their life to see that there's much more beyond the immediate tragedy of sinking. Father, you have so much good that you want to do for us and through us for your glory. Help us this day, our Father. And we thank you for the times that you've picked us up to put our feet upon the rock again and that we're living for Jesus Christ. Lord, strengthen your people this day. For we thank you in his name. Amen.